It surely is good. It really is good. See back to Circleville Camp Meeting. I love this place and the spirit of this camp meeting. All across America, we talk about it. You just can't imagine how we talk about it. I'm in a camp meeting down in Oklahoma with Wally and Ginger Laxon, and we sit around the dining table with the district superintendent and other workers, and we talk about Circleville Camp Meeting. <laughs> and we say right there in their presence, you ain't never been to camp meeting until you've been to Circleville. <laughs> and they know that puts them in second place for sure. I'm not trying to be patronizing nor ingratiating. I tell you truly, I'll go on record. The Churches of Christ and Christian Union consistently have the most exciting camp meetings in America. And at the risk of sounding a little too egocentric, I've had the privilege of preaching in the great majority of the Holiness Camp Meetings from Maine to California and Michigan to Florida. And consistently the most in exciting camp meetings. Churches of Christ and Christian Union. It's good to be back to Circleville. I'm especially partial to the Churches of Christ and Christian Union. Uh, they're a part of me and I'm a part of them forever. And I'm already 50% Church of Christ and Christian Union. And after I saw this official history book and the fact that my name was in it, I became 60%. <laughs> the denomination to which I belong has not yet put my name in their official history book. You better warn them about the direction I'm headed in if they don't do something quick. <laughs> and what will they do then? Because they won't have anybody left as humble as me. <laughs> uh, uh, mm. Oh, great time. <laughs> I tell you right now, Circleville Camp Meeting was famous before we started talking about it, but I'm not joking. I tell you, we get... Paul Qualls and Stuart McWhorter get down in South Alabama, Beulah Camp Meeting. We sit around and talk about Circleville. <laughs> we love this place. Uh, we really do. Great spirit, great crowd. I like this team I'm with this year because I'm so much younger. <laughs> I've yearned to be the boy preacher again, and this week I've finally made it. <laughs> oh, they're a great team. And of course, your general superintendent and his wife and, and all those who are engaged in attending to the matters of hospitality have been uh, most gracious to us. It's such a relaxed atmosphere. The book of Job, chapter 1. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I want to speak to you this evening about the test or the trials of Job. And I shall divide them into seven categories. And the first test or trial for Job, when I name it, will no, no doubt surprise you. And I'm confident that you never thought of it as being a test or a trial. And if you had thought of it as being a test or a trial, you would have prayed to be tested and tried. Because the first test or trial for Job was the test of success. The test of success. Now, of course, as you well know, success can take many different forms. Popularity, influence, prestige, fame. In Job's case, 
Success took the form of material prosperity. For Job, the Bible tells us, was the wealthiest man in the ancient East. Wealthy, truly wealthy in terms of material wealth. In this false economy, this mortgaged false economy that we Americans have been living in for about 40 years and are just about to reap the consequences of. <laughs> in this false economy that we've been living in, uh, there's not very much real personal material wealth. I meet a few people every now and then that I think are wealthy. And I get to know them better and I find out that at best they are but well to do. And that most of their possessions are mortgaged wealth in our false economy. I get to know most folk that seem to be quite well to do and quite prosperous and I find out that most of them are living exactly like the McQuirters. They're mortgaged until 973 years past the rapture. <laughs> somebody said, somebody said, our furniture goes back to Louis the Fourteenth. I said, that's nothing. Ours goes back to Sears the Fifteenth. <laughs> There's not much real personal material wealth in our false economy. But Job, but Job was a truly wealthy man in terms of material possessions. And in the midst of his success, in the midst of his prosperity, he worshipped and honored God. Now, I'm going to touch on something that will raise a lot of questions that I cannot deal with from the standpoint of time tonight. And I know there's another side to the coin that I cannot get into for time's sake. But let me pause to say something. I, and I'm going to say it very bluntly, despite the size of the crowd, it's still an inner circle crowd. And therefore, I'm going to speak a little more frankly than I might otherwise and say quite candidly, I simply do not buy the charismatic bag about health and wealth. Now, I could say that in a nicer way. You know, there's a, there's a way to say the same thing and say it nicely or crudely. Dr. Brasher who was a tremendous influence in my background in many respects, but his, his sophistication and his polish didn't get through to me. Uh, Dr. Brasher, you know, you know, Dr. Brasher would never say anything like, <clears throat> he bugged me or that bugged me. He had such an eloquent, sophisticated way of saying things, you know, very well at this place. Nobody could say it like John L. Brasher. And Dr. Brasher would never say, that bugged me. He would always say, that was a strain on my charity. <laughs> now, it meant exactly the same thing, but it sounded so much nicer. But for the sake of brevity, I'll put it quickly and bluntly, I simply do not buy the charismatic bag about health and wealth, however crudely that might be put. But I do say, nonetheless, despite that fact, I still say, in all kindness but in all candor, that we have had a tendency in the Christian religion and in the evangelical faith and in the holiness movement to imperceptibly, unconsciously glorify poverty. 
And I'm here to tell you, and it's more here than I can handle tonight just from the standpoint of time, and I wish I had time to handle it. But I'm here to tell you that when somebody, you know, when somebody goes off on the, loses out spiritually who had a lot of wealth, they'll say, oh, they made a lot of money, forgot about God, their home was wrecked and everything went wrong. Wealth ruined them. It was not the wealth that ruined them. It was their inner attitude and their wrong relationships that ruined them spiritually. And people, because people make news and are glamorous who are wealthy, we notice the tragedies of their lives and publicize it. But we say very little about the devastation and the wreckage and the ruin and the stress and the strain that poverty brings. And I know that's quite an area. And I know there are questions I'd like to deal with and cannot from the standpoint of time. But I just want to say this briefly. God does not put any prize on poverty. Now holding this folk, you better say amen or owe me or ten four right there, or I'll think there's game in that holler and I'll get worser and worser. <laughs> say amen. amen. Poverty doesn't make anybody godly. If it did, I'd be a saint. <laughs> Poverty doesn't make anybody godly. And wealth doesn't make anybody ungodly. It's our inner attitudes and our inner relationships to God and to our possessions. Say amen. Poverty never has made anybody a saint. The same poverty that has made some people pray more, the same poverty has made other people bitter and cynical and resentful and wicked. Well, you see where I want to go, but time forbids. Job was a wealthy man. And I'm sick and tired, despite the charismatic era, era, despite the terrible, awful, repelling over or misconception of this thing in our day, I'm weary of us thinking that somehow or another God wants the devil and his crowd to have all the material wealth of this world and somehow or another God really does not. Now we don't say this. We don't say this audibly. We don't face it in our conscious minds, rarely. But almost imper but imperceptibly, we almost think, in effect, that somehow God does not want his people to have material wealth. It's not biblical. Amen. Say amen. amen. I think God would be pleased. I know we're not going to all get wealthy, and I'm not trying to preach that. But I think God would be pleased if some saved and sanctified folk would get some of the wealth of this world and use it to the glory of God. Amen. Well, amen. Amen, amen. 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 Say amen. amen. Or I'll get mean if you don't. <laughs> I'm a little bit mean already. In the midst, he was a wealthy man, and he worshipped, and he served, and he remembered, and he honored God. The next test for Job was the test of adversity. In a sudden, shattering series of cataclysmic, catastrophic events, and I hope you're duly impressed by that phrase. I worked on it all week. <laughs> In a sudden, shattering series of cataclysmic, catastrophic events, all of Job's material world was laid into utter wreckage, total devastation, total desolation, 
everything of his material life was suddenly, severely, swiftly swept away. And Job said, I know what I'll do. I'll lay my hand on the radio. <laughs> and I'll send ten dollars to Tulsa. <laughs> and I'll get it all back. Well, at least you're awake. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. And despite the humor, I speak with utter seriousness now when I tell you, hear me, apart from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, I know of nothing in the long history of mankind more sublime and more noble than what Job did. Hallelujah. Amen. In the long history of mankind, apart from the resurrection, apart from the crucifixion of our blessed Lord, I know of nothing more sublime, nothing of more magnificent faith than what Job did in the total wreckage and devastation and desolation and utter ruin of his material life. Come on. Job said, let's sing the doxology. <laughs> That's what it meant. Job bowed down. I'm not saying, I'm not speaking flippantly. I'm not speaking lightly. I'm not speaking glibly. I'm not saying nor wanting to suggest that it was easy. I'm not trying to suggest that it was easy or flippant or casual. But nevertheless, Job bowed down in the midst of the total devastation and desolation. And Job said, The Lord gave. I like that part, don't you? I can hook on to that, can't you? That side suits me. The Lord gave. Job said, the Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> now, Job was wrong. Job was right when he said the Lord gave. Job was wrong when he said, the Lord taketh away. Now you must understand, you do know, you already know. And when I say it, it'll sound rather trite, but it needs to be remembered. Job, to put it crudely, Job did not have a Bible. Did you ever think of it that way? Job did not have a Bible. Job lived before. I'm not talking about the dating of the writing of the book. I'm talking about the time in which Job himself lived. I know about the debate about the writing of the book. Blah, 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 blah. I'm talking about when Job lived. Job did not have a Bible. Job had neither temple nor tabernacle. Job, hear it, you know it. It sounds rather trite to emphasize it, but it's crucial that we remember it. Job lived before the fully developed message of the prophets. Job lived before the rich, full development of the rich Hebrew religion with its lofty concepts of the holiness of God and its moral precepts. Job lived way back there. Job did not have a Bible. And Job, in his remote and dim and distant concept of God, said the Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. He was right when he said the Lord gave. He was wrong when he said the Lord taketh away. It was God who was giving, but it was not God who was taking away. The Bible tells us plainly it was the devil who was taking away. 
And now wait a minute. I know, I know what some say. I'm not going to get into a didactic discussion of it here. I'm just not going to do it. But I know what some say. Some say that Job was an oriental stoic when he said, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, and it was a stoical expression. I don't accept that. I don't accept that. I believe that in his remote and limited understanding of God, he leaped out by spiritual intuition and sheer faith and said, in effect, it seems to me that he's both giving and taking, and I don't know altogether what he's doing or why he's doing it, but I bless his name. <laughs> Woo! Ha, 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 ha! And despite the limitation of his knowledge, and despite his mistaken concept of God taking away, his faith was no less sublime. His faith was no less magnificent. If he was saying from his vantage point, I don't know all that God's doing, but I know I bless his name. He's worthy of my worship. And then he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Hallelujah. Boy, that's a far cry from the charismatic bag, isn't it? Huh? Huh? I know you think I'm kind of getting a little bloody tonight, but it's still so. Come on. And it's the heart of biblical faith. The Hebrew boy said, Our God's able and he will, but if he does not, we'll still not bow. God's not on trial. We're not debating God's power. We Wesleyan Arminian holiness folk have been forced into a defensive position. And we've been so nice and so passive that we're just about forced to get out of our corner. And some are saying that we question God's power when we don't say that everybody's going to be healed. We believe in divine healing. We preach divine healing. We've experienced divine healing. We've seen divine healing. We do not doubt the power of God to heal. But some have put us in a defensive position because they say, we, they say, in effect, we limit God's power because we don't say everybody's going to be healed all the time. We're not questioning God's power. We're simply admitting to the very heart of Bible faith, which is this. Are you listening? Are you listening? Don't you miss it. As the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways above our ways. They are past finding out who can know the mind of the Lord. If we understood it all, we wouldn't need faith at all. We are not saying that we question God's power. We're simply saying that God is a God whose ways in our finite mind, whose ways we cannot understand, but a God whose character we can perfectly trust. Because we, above and beyond dear brother Job, we, bless my soul, have seen him in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that no matter what the world and the devil say, we know that the poet was not merely romanticizing nor sentimentalizing when he wrote, and fierce though the fiends may fight, and long though the angels hide, I know that truth and right have the universe on their side. And that somewhere beyond the stars is a love that is better than fate. When the night unlocks her bars, I shall see him and I will wait. Woo! We know 
that the poet was not wallowing in mere sentimentalism when he said, within the maddening haze of life, when tossed by storm and flood, to this fixed trust my spirit clings. I know that God is good. I know not where his islands lift their fronded palms in air. I only know I cannot drift beyond his love and care. <laughs> I trust his character. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'll keep my hope in him. I'll keep my trust in him. Job said, and I... I, 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 get, I make a very loose paraphrase in the vernacular Job was saying even when God seems like he's wanting to kill me or in other words Job said even when God seems to the fullest extent to be my enemy I know he's still trustworthy Amen. now you know obviously that trustworthy is the most fitting of all synonyms for friend. For friend. Job said in a very loose vernacular paraphrase, Job said in effect, even when God seems to be my enemy, I know he's my friend. Amen. Job said, even when God seems to be against me, I know he... Now, wait a minute. Over in the book of Romans, against the rich background of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the innumerable mercies of grace through the gospel, Paul wrote, If God, or since God is for us, who can be against us? Paul said, look at the cross. Look at the empty tomb. Look at the incarnation. God is for us. I wish I could dig that out. Woo, I wish I could handle that. Man, I wish I could dig that out. I want to tell you I'm not just engaging in melodramatics. You will never... You will never lay hold of anything more absolutely dynamic. No, nothing more revolutionary, nothing more transforming in all your life. Nothing will ever charge and thrill and liberate your soul more than when it becomes more than a vague ideal, when it becomes a deep, gripping, settled certainty that you know that God is for you. That God is your friend. Woo! Bless my soul. Do you see it? But Paul wrote that against the rich background of the gospel. But Job never heard the name of Jesus. Job never heard the gospel. Job never heard about the resurrection or the crucifixion or the atonement or the incarnation. And yet, by sheer faith, he leaped out and something deep within his soul said, God, centuries and centuries before Paul wrote it against the background of the gospel, Job said, I know God is for me. I know he's trustworthy. I know he's my friend. That's what it means. I know he said a lot of other things. But when you brought it all down, he came out with the assurance that God was his friend. Blessed be God forever. Hallelujah. The next test for Job was the test of sorrow. Not one casket, but a long line of the caskets of his children. And the next, and I'm just skipping that for time's sake. The next test was the physical test. Covered from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with terrible sores and awful affliction that totally isolated him from society. And the psychological stress of that isolation was undoubtedly even worse than the physical agony. 
Well, there's an entire sermon here, and I'm struggling right now to abbreviate and leave out what I want to put in. But let me just suffice it to say that in this realm of the physical, you'd better have a relationship with God that's more than feeling. For a day will come, a day may come, when the fever's so hot and high and the pain's so terrible that you are not enjoying the moods that you call feeling spiritual. The day may come when the pain's so terrible that you cannot even think to pray. But I want to tell you something. You can have a relationship with God. You can be more than a spiritual hypochondriac. All the time feeling your emotional pulse, you can have a relationship with God until you can say reverently, not flippantly, but reverently, when the pain gets so terrible that you cannot even think to pray deep in your innermost being inaudibly, you can say in effect, thank God, I don't have to pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on. Amen. You can say, I can't think to pray. I can't think at all. The pain's too terrible. My, 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 my sensibilities, my, my reasoning is fading and I know it. And I can't, I can't compose a prayer. But you can know in an inaudible way that your soul has already said, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that everything that I've committed to him against that day. You know, the Christian only lives for two days. The Christian only lives for two days, this day and that day. And I've committed everything to him against that day. And when the pain's so terrible and the fever's so hot and high that I can't, I can't enjoy moods that are called spiritual moods and I can't feel like I'm on cloud nine, hallelujah, I can know it's all committed to him. And please, I underscore my reverence. I do not say it to be flippant. But you can say reverently, thank God, I've already prayed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now I'm sure you understand the very limited sense in which I mean that. But bless God, it's still so. <laughs> Hallelujah. The next test for Job was the test of domestic unhappiness. Job had... A nagging wife. If I'd have been married to that old gal, I'd have, I'd have joined the French Foreign Legion and signed up for a lifetime assignment in the Sahara. Curse God and die she said. But did you ever study what Job said to her? Job said, you talk like one of the foolish women. If you'll study the structure of Job's statement to her, I don't say this dogmatically, but if you'll study the structure of Job's statement to her carefully, it might be that we have not been totally fair with Job's wife. Job said, you talk like one of the foolish women. If you study the structure of it, it suggests the possibility that Job might have been saying that she was saying something that she was not a foolish woman, but in this case she was talking like a foolish woman, and that it was out of character for her. And it could have been that under this awful prolonged stress, think what she had been through. She had shared the sorrow. She had shared the wreckage. She had shared the material loss. She had shared the grief over the death of all the children. Think of the stress she had been through. And I suggest 
I only suggest. But it very well could be that in this prolonged extreme stress, she said something out of character for her. Amen. Oh, how it would help us as wholeness folk to elaborate there. How it would help us in our human relations and our understandings and our misunderstandings. Amen. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about sin. But I'm saying that even the sanctified may under extreme prolonged stress, not sin, not carnality, but under extreme prolonged se stress, may say something out of character. Now, of course, if it becomes a repeated pattern, I'm not talking about that, but something very exceptional and out of character. And I'm not giving room nor quarters for carnality, but we need to dig in here, and I believe it would really enrich and improve our human relationships. Say amen. amen. The next test for Job was the, the intellectual test aggravated by his miserable comforters. Along they came. The advisory board. The advisory board. This crowd cannot fully appreciate that pun, but I love it. <laughs> the advisory board came along. Did you hear about the fellow who was praying? And he said, oh, Lord, use me. Use me, Lord, use me, especially in an advisory capacity. <laughs> the advisory board came along, self-appointed spiritual detectives. Some folk have microscopic religion. Other folk have telescopic religion. The folk who have telescopic religion are stargazing. The folk who have microscopic religion are hunting bacteria. Along came these spiritual detectives. Along came these spiritual self-appointed arbiters for God. Spiritual detectives. With their microscopes. Hunting bacteria. And they said, Brother Job, we've come over to tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> and I know they said a lot of other things. But the gist of what they said was this. Are you listening? They said, in essence, in effect, they said, Job, listen now, listen very closely. Don't miss it. They said, Job, point one, God rewards righteousness in this present life. Point two, God punishes sin in this present life. Point three, this would not have happened to you if you had not, if you, if you had a right relationship with God. Point four, if you had a right relationship with God, you would have your health and your wealth. That's the gist of their argument. Does it sound familiar? Have you heard it anywhere lately? Brother, if you don't recognize it, you ain't been listening to what's been going on in the American religious scene lately. What I just said is the gist of the argument of Job's miserable comforters, and it's strikingly parallel and contemporary with what's being said and bombarded in a popular sort of way through the religious media of our day. I was holding a meeting in one of our large holiness churches over in Indiana, northern Indiana. 
And a precious, sensitive, sincere young couple came to me and they, they, they were sensitive. And the husband had lost his job, not because of laziness and he was seeking work, but because of economic depression in the area, he'd lost his job. They had a five-year-old child chronically, critically ill, the child's life hanging by a brittle thread, literally. And some relatives of theirs persuaded them to go to one of these super-duper, souped-up, whatchamacallit, meetings. And they went with them. And I don't believe those relatives meant to be cruel, but in effect they were cruel because this sensitive couple came to me and they said, Brother McWhorter, we went to a certain big meeting, you know, and our relatives tell us that if we had a right faith relationship with God, the husband would get a job and the child would be healed. I tell you, that's cruel. Hear it? That's cruel. And what's worse than that is these dirty rascals that commercialize on it. The dirty, rotten crooks. You don't like the way I said it? I'll say it again. The dirty, rotten crooks that commercialize on human suffering. Say amen or oh me. Rotten crooks that commercialize on pain and suffering and human desperation. Rotten, dirty, deceiving, religious crooks. Say amen or I'll go to town. I'll get their hides and hang them to a sour apple tree if you don't say amen. Oh, brother, we, we, we've been passive so long. And I'm not trying to be belligerent for the sake of belligerence. But it's time we took the word of God and made some people who have forced us into a defensive position put up or shut up. They said, in effect, if you had a right relationship with God, right kind of relationship, like this, you'd have your health and your wealth. Joe, right in the midst of all that, brother, it's a wonderful thing to keep a sense of humor. You better keep a sense of humor. Job kept a sense of humor. Right in the midst of all that, Job kept a sense of humor. I like it. Job looked at him and said, yes, oh, you're the people, you're the crowd, you're the jet set, you're the in crowd, and wisdom will die with you. I like that. I like it. I like it for two reasons. I like it because in the midst of all this terrible tragedy, Job kept his sense of humor. And I like it for the second reason, because it was sarcastic. <laughs> wisdom will wisdom will die with you. It was the gist of the argument, but the heart of the message of the book of Job is that they were wrong. And that their syllogism and that their argument was diametrically opposed to the Bible meaning and message of faith in God. Do you see it? And the next test for Job was the intellectual test. The next test for Job was not the intellectual but the spiritual test. The supreme spiritual test. When God seemed to hide. Oh, it's wonderful to feel good. It's wonderful to feel like smiling. It's noble to smile when you don't feel like smiling. It's commendable to smile when you don't feel like smiling. But you won't always feel like smiling. It's commendable to smile when you don't feel like smiling, but I get awfully weary. I get awfully weary 
It is indeed, as Dr. Brasher would say, a strain on my charity when I listen so constantly to this gushy stream of oopy goopy gobbledygook religion that says that if you really are what you ought to be, you're going to all the time be a kind of Alka-Seltzer Christian fizzing with emotion. <laughs> I get so tired of this oopy goopy shallow sentimental stuff that says if you really are a spiritual Christian you'll go around saying peaches and cheese and monkeys all the time. <laughs> Job said hear it Job said, God is hiding from me. Yes, he did. God seems to be hiding from me. I wonder where these hip hoorah oopy goopy folk are when they read that. I wonder where they are when they read where Jesus himself. Are you listening? Amen. I wonder where they are. When they read where Jesus himself on the cross didn't start singing some little ditty. And I'm not trying to be irreverent, God forbid. But you know my point. Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. Job said, he hideth himself from me. Hear it tonight, friends. Somewhere, some way, somehow, someday, you may come to a point when all the props are knocked out and every step is a leap in the dark and your mood is low and your emotions are playing tricks on you and your feelings are numb and the heavens seem brassy and your prayers seem to bounce back. And you have to pick up your feet, spiritually speaking, and just go on in a kind of a cold, mechanical way. Come on. Come on. Be honest. Be honest. You have to just pick up your feet and go on in a kind of a cold, mechanical way. You just go through the motions, and you don't feel a thing. And you know you have not willfully sinned against God. You know. You know. You know. And you just pick up your feet and you go on in a kind of cold. You don't feel a thing. The heavens are blessed. Your prayers seem to bounce back. God seems to hide. The props are all knocked out. And you just pick up your feet. And you do nothing. But in a cold, mechanical way, just keep going on. Just keep going on. You just keep going on. I'm absolutely sure that's what Paul Qualls did back there in 1973 when he watched his son die for months. Just keep going on. And if you're a layman, you feel like that, you go through that kind of experience, and you're on the job or in the office or at the factory, and you have an opportunity to witness for Christ, a very appropriate Opportunity. I'm not talking about buttonholing somebody and forcing them to get saved out of self-defense. I believe in personal evangelism, but don't believe in personal insanity. I don't believe in getting folks saved out of self-defense. Say amen. Boy, I'm in a mean mood tonight. <laughs> the trouble about it all is that it's ever bit premeditated. <laughs> but you come to that moment. Heavens are brass. Mood's low. You don't feel a thing. You feel mechanical. You're a layman. You're out there. And there's a very appropriate, ripe opportunity to witness. And you go ahead and you witness. And you don't feel a thing. And you get in your car, drive home from work, and the devil says, you're cold, you're mechanical, you don't have it. You witness, where's all that joy and that Christian life you're telling them about? You don't have it. Maybe the problem's 
physical. Maybe the problem is a point of psychological stress at that time. So forth and so on. And the devil says, you're cold, mechanical. And the preacher, oh, the preacher comes along. And you think the preacher, you think if the preacher's God's man, he's going to feel like hoopy doo every time he gets in the pulpit. Oh, that's a lot of nonsense. I get in the pulpit a lot of times when I barely feel religious. Come on now. Preachers, preachers. Uh, uh, yeah, I just I get in the pulpit every now and then when I just barely feel religious. I preach because I'm on the program. <laughs> and the Lord knows my heart. And the devil comes. Come on, preachers. And layman, it applies to you also. In your sphere of witnessing, the devil comes and says, Preacher, you're cold. You're mechanical. You're merely professional. You're just going through the motions. You don't have it. And the accuser of the brethren heaps false guilt on you, preacher and layman alike. Amen. Do you hear me? I, I, I tell you, I just preach where I live. And I find out about 99% of the other people live the same place. And you just keep going on. Well, you don't feel like going on. And the devil used to hound me a lot about that. But one day God showed me that in the long stretch, it just might be that they'll ultimately, when the final records are completed and the final books are closed and the final rewards are handed out, it just might be that there will be more glory in just going on. Amen. When you don't feel like going on, Amen. than in going on when you do feel like going on. But you keep on going on. And you might just keep on going on for a long time. It might be soon, it might be later, but I guarantee you. Sooner or later, even if it's much later, if you just, if you'll just keep going on, come on, it might be much later, but if you'll just keep going on, I guarantee you, if you just keep going on, somewhere, Somehow, some way, some day, the fires of assurance will begin to kindle and burn and blaze and leap on the altar of your heart. And like Job, God will finally enable you to say, He knoweth the way I take. And when he hath tried me, Woo! I shall come forth as pure gold. And I know, I know that my Redeemer, now that word Redeemer is not the New Testament word. It means my defender, my lawyer, my advocate, my champion. Job said, and I know that my defender, my lawyer, lives. Ah, ah, ah. Woo! That's what it means. And I'll see him someday. Before the doctrine of immortality was developed, Job said, I will see him in my flesh even after the word Woo! Now he didn't have a New Testament and he didn't have a gospel, but he said, when the worms have eaten up my body, I'll see my lawyer in my body of flesh. Woo! And the miserable comfort
interpreters don't know me. Did you hear it? The advisory board doesn't know me. These miserable comforters are not going to judge me. These miserable comforters are not going to present my case. Come on! That's what it means. Job said these guys are not going to judge me. They don't really know my record. They don't really know me. Did you hear that? Hallelujah. Nobody really knows you. And nobody really knows me. Your husband, your wife. Come on. Your closest loved one, your dearest friend. Nobody really knows you. Nor me. But God. Job said, and I, I, Job said in effect, he knows me. And I'll see him someday in a body of flesh. Whoo, that's exciting. Before the message of the resurrection, he said, I'm going to live after this body is consumed in the grave. And I'm going to see the one who really knows me. These fellows have said a lot of things about me, but he knows the truth about me. And he will set the record straight about Job. And he will set the record straight about you. For he's my day's man. Let me give you briefly the gospel according to Job. Chapter 9, verse 33, Job complains. He says there is no day's man betwixt God and me, between God and me. Job says, in effect, I need a day's man between God and me. Before temple or tabernacle or Ten Commandments, before a cross or an empty grave or a resurrection or a gospel sermon or a Bethlehem manger, Job said, with faith leaping out, with sheer faith leaping out, Job said, I need a day's man between God and me, the gospel according to Job. You know what a day's man was? In those ancient days, a day's man, D-A-Y-S-M-A-N, one word, was one of the city elders. And when a dispute arose between two men, the day's man was the mediator who sat between the two men to communicate between them, to reconcile them. And the custom was the day's man would put one hand on the shoulder of one man and one hand on the shoulder of the other man and sit between the two and, co and mediate between them until they communicated and were reconciled. Job said, I need a day's man. Without a gospel, without a Bible, without a New Testament, Job said, I need a day's man. Thank God for the gospel according to Job. Thank God for the gospel that you and I have tonight. For tonight, the divine day's man has come. <laughs> the divine day's man has come. <laughs> Job in the shadows groped and said, I need a mediator. The divine days man has come. His name is Jesus Christ. He has put one hand on man and one hand on God. He is the mediator between God and man. The one man, Christ Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. Bless my soul, glory be to God, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed. I want the strains of, I must tell Jesus, if you can prepare it, I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. And tonight in this campaign, as I travel in the work of evangelism across the country and around the world, Many of God's people who are saved and sanctified and know the Lord. Many of God's people who are saved and sanctified and know the Lord. 
share with me their burdens, their heartaches, their prolonged, peculiar, perplexing heartaches and griefs and anxieties and difficulties and distresses. Many of God's people who are saved and sanctified and know the Lord tell me they've gone through some prolonged heaviness of spirit, some prolonged grief or anxiety or perplexity, some seemingly overwhelming responsibility or decision or situation. And even though they know they're saved and sanctified, they've come to the point where it seemed almost overwhelming and it seemed that they could hardly take another step in their own strength. And they needed a special sense of reinforcement from the Lord. And they needed, like Hezekiah, to just take it before the Lord and lay it before the Lord. And many of God's people who are saved and sanctified have told me that they went through these situations they could not put into words because they could not find words to describe it. Couldn't tell it to the dearest friend or loved one because they could not find the words. And you know and I know there are those situations, those anxieties, those perplexities, those decisions, those responsibilities, those nebulous, oppressive situations that you cannot put into words, try as you may, and you have to bear it all alone. Many of God's people, saved and sanctified, said, I feel like I can hardly take another step in the street. And in a rather crucial, urgent way, they needed a special sense of release and reinforcement and reassurance. And they needed to just lay it before the Lord. But because they were saved and sanctified, they did not always know how to relate themselves to the altar. So at least once in every campaign, and tonight in this one, I deliberately opened the altar for God's people who were saved and sanctified. Now wait a minute. I am not, I am not talking about the routine problems of life that we all have every day. I am not talking about the routine problems of life. I'm talking about some seemingly overwhelming decision or responsibility or heartache or difficulty or perplexity or situation some seemingly crushing situation where you need a special sense of help and reinforcement and you need the you need the you need the spiritual therapy of symbolically physically laying it before the Lord at an altar of prayer you need the you need the catalyst you need the the God ordained Holy Ghost therapy of symbolically laying it before the Lord and literally spiritually laying it before the Lord at the altar of prayer. I'm not talking about the routine problems of life. I'm talking about some seemingly crushing, overwhelming, prolonged heaviness of spirit or decision or difficulty or responsibility. I'm opening the altar for God's people who are facing such a decision or responsibility or anxiety our concern, our crushing concern that you need to lay before the Lord and you cannot put into words. I want you right now. Now what I'm going to ask you to do is going to be a little different. It will not be convenient. What I'm asking you to do will not be convenient physically because of the way we're seated. But while we're seated like this, I want every one of God's people who know the Lord but you've been going through some situation or decision or responsibility that's seemingly crushing and overwhelming and you need a special sense of reassurance and reinforcement from God, I want you to quietly, deliberately, intelligently get up and make your way out to the altar and come and kneel here with me and let's lay it before the Lord. Come on, get up and come, get up and come. That's it. What I'm asking you to do will not be convenient because of the way we're seated. But right now, right now, while we're seated, while we're bowed in prayer, just to the strains of the music, that's it. Just get up and come. Get up and come. Just deliberately, intelligently make your way out to the place of prayer. Come on. That's it. Just deliberately, intelligently get up and come. That's it. Just deliberately make your way out. Just deliberately, quietly just deliberately, quietly, intelligently make your way out to the altar. Just get up and come. That's it. Get up and come. Get up and come. Get up and come. I'm not talking about routine problems. I'm talking about some decision or some responsibility 
or some crossroads you're facing where you, it seems almost overwhelming and you need special reinforcement and a special sense of, of direction and help from God and you, you just need to lay it before the Lord, get up and come, get up and come, get up and come, get up and come, get up and come. That's it. That's it. Just get up and come. 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 Brother Qualls, I believe we'll sing it from memory. You know it. We can all sing it from memory. And we will stand briefly while we sing a stanza from memory. Let us stand. Come on. Come on. Come on.